Okay, now let's look at the politics, Africa, the reality today. Uh, is there a way that fear could have be uh, a tool that is used to keep Africa the way it is today? Looking at the global political setup. <laughs> Behi, uh, I don't like talking about politics, but let me just try to uh, say it the way it is. Um, the politics of Africa is not a consequence of African immediate um, happening. You know, when you study, uh, when you look at definition of reality in the perspective of Thomas Aquinas and even um, um, Aristotle, when he said definition, when you want to understand or define a thing, you, you understand it from four causes. But Africans tend to shy away from their first cause. Uh, because I would like to use a language that people will understand. Their first cause. And this first cause happens to be the basis of their history. And when you, when you try in an immediate time to tell people about their history, they will say you are trying to cause problems. They see you as a threat. All these people that wants to cause, disrupt this, this status quo, something that happened back in the past. You want to bring it up now. Why are you bringing it up now? Eh? We'll be living in peace. Now you see the place of fear there. Now, go, get, going back to history, you realize that before the Berlin Conference, before partitioning Africa, those who did that had something in mind. And I cannot really say their intention, but I would say that it, hasn't been, it has not been a, a blessing, but a cause to the African continent. The partitioning at the Berlin Conference and what happened after Second World War that led to British and uh, France taking over Cameroon, from the, the from Germany, Germany is also something that we need to look at carefully. When you look at it carefully, you will see why selective aid and selective attention is also becoming part of the global politics. Practical example, I'm not saying that what is happening in uh, Ukraine between Russia and Ukraine is good. But something more than that has been happening in Africa. Practical example, look at not, uh, Northern and Southern Kaduna. You come to the East, look at uh, um, what is happening with um, IPOP and the military. And look at what is also happening. Uh, look at what happened during the civil war in Nigeria. It was the genocide. But the attention the world is giving to Ukraine, they didn't even do that here. So this idea of kill and divide is a systemic fear culture that was developed to cage the African people. They make policies that affect the African people. Unless Africa rise on this occasion, unless Africa realizes it, that there can be, and others can also, will also be. I mean, um, you see how strong EU is? Look at AU, look at AU. They can't rise on occasion of anything. Africa doesn't have a currency. No African currency is as strong as uh, those of uh, um, um, Europe and America, none. And they are making policies. Terrorism had never been, was not part of African development or African history. It's something that was, uh, is a product of a borrowed religion. It's a 
shift in the mind of certain persons. But now that it's now been practiced in Africa, who supplied this terrorist group uh, weapon? How do they get those weapons? And as a result, then I say, close your border so that the terrorists will not come. And Nigeria will not apply for visa to go to uh, uh, South Africa. But an American and someone from Europe walks in freely. So for these are the, so you look at it, you say, it is the immediate problem. No, it's not an immediate problem. It, we have underlying factors, something that is scaring these people to close their, to shut down their border against their brothers. So you can talk about uh, the former uh, causes and the fear factors. You know, you look at them critically, which um, I may not be able to um, talk about here now for some reasons, but not to me. So we, but for, as Africans, we need to come back to unscript, the scripted about Africa and to look at it. Our elders, they might not be able to do that because it will affect those in power when we start um, on scripting the scripted about Africa. So, and if you fight the existing system, you will be in trouble. The best way is to build a better system that will make this existing system obsolete. And that's why you see analog leaders in the digital age controlling the affairs of Africa. And I want to remind you, if you don't know that, 60% of the world's youngest population are in Africa, and the 70% of the population are residing in sub-Saharan Africa. How prepared are the youths when the button of leadership will come to Africa? <laughs> Most Americans, uh, young Americans, they are interested in Bitcoin cryptocurrency and uh, uh, YouTubing and all that. Average youth is not interested in sitting down to make critical thinking analysis and predict the future as such. So we are shedding, we are chasing shadows instead of uh, solving frictions, existential frictions that will help us to become better as SPC. So when I talk to someone, I send someone an email or, or I travel to United States, I meet someone. I have experienced that on LinkedIn, I was talking to one man and we booked an appointment. He said he won't talk to me because I'm a black. So it was a shock. And I reported the account and I reported the man. So you reach out to someone, you say you are you um you are a Yahoo person. They, they see you, they see many um people from Africa, especially Nigeria and Ghana, as internet froster. Who told you that they are? Is it that they don't have uh, uh, Russians, uh, Americans, and all that who are into internet fraud? Why must you now make uh, this uh, uh, an issue uh, or something that is peculiar? I'm not saying it's good. Anyways, these are part of the things that I've been going to university, reaching out to people to preach against. Why? Because you cannot abandon your papers as a person and pursue something that has nothing to do with your papers. So there's, there are a lot of things, uh, Obehi, um, just try, I'm, I'm beginning to get angry with the whole system and the whole process. And we need to, uh, yes, I'm beginning to get angry with the whole system and process. And we need to come down and do this. There are a lot of things that we need to do as Africans. There are a lot of things. We need to change the narrative. Uh, please, nobody should donate to the, I've been saying it. Why are you donating to the government? They are donating to the government and they sold it. Check out how much that uh, um, um, Bill Gates donated to Nigeria to fight malaria and all those things and polio, and it wasn't used. Look at stop, stop, support idea, monitor the process. We are not hungry. Africans, we are not hungry. I, I always tell people if you want to make programs for Africa, don't post pictures of hungry people, people that are suffering. Americans are also, many people are suffering just that they have a better system, a better society. Most Americans don't have up to 1,000 USD in their accounts, but they have a viable system. That's just the difference. 
So stop posting Africans, posting pictures of people who are hungry, people who are begging, people with torn clothes. No. The highest form of poverty, like I said, if you look at my, uh, uh, our organizational website, is not material poverty, but poverty of the mind. If you er eradicate poverty of the mind, people can stand on their own to think. The world is evolving in the, in, in the age, better in the age of individually prepared growth, uh, which is uh, the basis of social entrepreneurship. So when people tell me all these things, I say, please, don't insult Africa. Let us reason together and see a way of finding a meeting point as uh, human persons from different uh, continents and uh, society. All right, fine. Let's look for a way to find solution to our problem. I understand, I understand that perfectly. That is very interesting. And that is why uh, the conversation around your industry, your company, we're going to take time to really look into it because I find it very, very interesting.